千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. As ever, I would like to extend a warm welcome to one and all. Thank you for joining us. I want to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware, as we all ready ourselves for this sacred process in the Tao with one another. Now, as usual, Chapter 73 has a title in Chinese, Tian Wang Zhang. So the same layout as before, three characters. The last character, the character to the right, is chapter. So the name is composed of two characters, Tian, and then the character in the middle, Wang. So the first character means heaven or sky, and the second character, the character in the middle, is net. So translated as heavenly net, what is the heavenly net? As we will see in this chapter, it is a term describing the Tao. The Tao is everywhere, covers everything, like an infinitely vast net. So the heavenly net is also everywhere. It also covers everything. It's infinitely vast, like the Tao. So despite the vastness, the heavenly net does not have gaps where things can slip through. And in fact, absolutely nothing and no one can escape the heavenly net. Now, because Tian, the, the first character there, can be translated as sky, you can put those together and you get sky net. This does not, however, mean that a certain director is familiar with the Tao Te Ching before writing the script for a particular movie that features sky net. It's just a coincidence. Let's get into the discussion of the chapter. First, by reading the chapter from beginning to end. Tao Te Ching, chapter 73. The bold in daring will be killed. The bold in not daring will survive. Of these two, one may benefit, the other may harm. The one hated by heaven, who knows the reason? Even the sages still find this difficult. The Tao of heaven does not contend and yet excels in winning, does not speak and yet excels in responding, is not summoned and yet excels in planning, and yet uh, comes on its own, is unhurried and yet excels in planning. The heavenly net is vast, loose, and yet does not let anything slip through. So that is chapter 73 of the Tao Te Ching. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we can break it down into sections. First, I've highlighted a couple of characters. Uh, the first two characters of line one and line two, you can tell just visually that they are the same characters. The translation is the same. The first character is the bold, and it can also be translated as the brave or the courageous. And then we have a preposition, in. So those are the same. Uh, you can compare the English with the Chinese. Now, looking at that first section, we can see just from the sense that it is trying to convey that the what, what it's talking about is the two. The first two lines are the two 
that's being discussed in line three, line four, and line five. So basically, the sense is that the bold and daring, the bold and not daring of these two, one benefits, the other one harms, one is hated by heaven, why? And even sages find this difficult. So that is actually one whole thought, a complete thought about the two different approaches that originate from being bold. Therefore, we can put a line there between line five and line six to mark a sectional difference. From line six on, line six says the Tao of heaven, and then it goes on to talk about, to describe the Tao of heaven. So we can be sure that is a section on its own. Now, back to lines one and two, we see the correspondence, we, we see the sameness of the characters in the first and second characters of those two lines. So that is more of a poetic construction. Then it goes on, spends three lines to talk about those two. So what we can see is we can use a thin line to represent how the first two lines are the beginning, a subsection of the first half. Then lines three, four, and five are the commentary on the first two things. So altogether, this entire section from line one to line five is about daring and not daring. That is the difference. Daring, in this case, the word daring in English has a positive connotation. When we say that someone is daring, we're talking about that person being courageous, that person is brave, etc. Usually, daring is not used in a negative sense in English. Here, Laozi is talking about daring in the sense of being reckless, like how dare you type of reckless. So it's actually a negative connotation. Keep that in mind, and this will make more sense. Now, let's take a look at the bottom half. Are there repeating characters there? I think you can see quite a few repeating characters in the same position from one line to the next. Let me go ahead and highlight what I see to see if it agrees with what you see. So lines seven, eight, and nine, they start with the same character. And then seven, eight, nine, ten, they all have the same middle character. Yeah, and you can reference what I have on the right hand side to see the translation, the corresponding translation. You can see that the first character, Bu, the, that's repeated in line seven, eight, and nine. It just means no or not. So depending on context, it will have to be translated differently. In two lines, we've got does not, because it's referencing the Tao, does not. And then in line nine, is not. So the same character translated as either does not or is not, and it can also be do not, are not, am not, etc. Then we have the character, the connecting character in the middle, and yet, and that's translated the same way, as you can see in the English part. So what is all this talking about? Well, everything here is talking about the Tao of heaven. It's a description of the Tao of heaven. And the last two lines is talking about the heavenly net. So we can draw a thin line there as well. Those two lines are the conclusion. And they, when talking about the heavenly net, that is actually another way to talk, talk about the Tao of heaven. So these are all synonymous with one another. So that is the sectional analysis. I think we have a pretty good idea. We can now go into the line by line explanation. So let's start with line one. The bold and daring will be killed. So this warrants some 
special explanations on the language side of it. So in modern usage, 勇敢 means bold, brave, or courageous. That's the two characters together. This is in common usage. This is utilized all the time in modern Mandarin. The ancient usage is different. 勇敢, the two characters are separated apart by one character, and the meaning is distinct from one another. So in the modern usage, both characters are depicting bravery and courage. In the ancient usage, they're talking about positive or neutral quantity and then a negative quantity. Let me explain. Yong, the first character, it still means bold, brave, or courageous. We're used to thinking that in a positive connotation as well. But the way that it's used by Laozi, it's actually neutral by itself. It's good, it's a good thing that you have courage, but it can lead you to a bad place if you are reckless in having that courage. That's what we're trying to say. So, the second character there, or the character that's uh, in the middle of line one, Gan, points to the thoughtless kind of daring, like damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, rushing forward, screaming at the top of your lungs to do battle, to attack uh, an enemy. So the meaning should now become clear the bold and daring will be killed, it basically says, if you are brave but reckless, that's going to lead to death. Another way to say it is that the Tao guarantees a negative result from being bold but thoughtless, brainless, idiotic. And this can apply to the battlefield in ancient times. It can also apply to modern life. And we'll talk more about that, the different levels of meaning in the Tao Te Ching. Let's go to the next line for the contrast. The bold in not daring will survive. If we did not understand the ancient contextual usage of these characters, this line can be confusing. The bold in not daring will survive. So are you brave or not brave? The bold seems to suggest that you are brave. The not daring seems to suggest that you are not. So that doesn't seem to make any sense at the surface level. Now, with the additional context, you can see that it's the reverse of line one. It's about being bold, but not rash. Being bold, but not thoughtless not just charging full speed ahead, maybe headlong into death. So the realization is that one can be courageous, but also thoughtful and patient. That is, you can be willing, able, eager to do what needs to be done, but you are being thoughtful and patient, so you are waiting for the right time. And overall, and in general, the Tao guarantees a positive result from being having that boldness, but also at the same time, uh, having that thoughtfulness. And even when you have a dire situation, you can survive that situation and persist. And um, this means you can live to fight another day. And this is something that comes in handy for us in our lives as well. There may be a disastrous situation, but if you can survive that situation, or if you can persist in a difficult situation when you're just ready to give up, but if you persist, you can then regroup, gather your strength, and wait for the right time to take action, wait for the right opportunity. And in the West, we oftentimes will say things like, discretion is the better part of valor. So valor is yet another word for courage, um, honor, bravery. Now, discretion is the better part of it, and that's because it's not enough 
to be brave, you also have to be wise. So this phrase, discretion is a better part of valor. It just means that caution is preferable to rash bravery. This is uh, said by one of William Shakespeare's characters uh, in King Henry IV, part one. So Eastern wisdom and Western wisdom, sometimes they coincide and agree on an important point. So let's further dissect this character, Yong. The character for bonus, for courage, for bravery. So in previous chapters, this is definitely talked about as well. Chapter 67 was an important chapter because it spoke of the three treasures of Laozi. And it has a line that references courage. It says compassionate, thus able to have courage. What it's basically saying is that compassion is the true source that you derive where you derive true courage. So the example that we used before was about mama bear protecting her young. That compassion to protect her young gives rise to the fierce defense of her children. And then in that same chapter, 67, it also talks about if one has courage but discards compassion, and then it goes on to say that it leads to death. What it's basically expressing is that courage without compassion will be the false kind of courage, really nothing more than just senseless brutality. So these are the thoughts that we encountered previously from Laozi about this character, Yong, courage. So in chapter 73, in the current chapter now, we've got the same character in two different ways, the bold and daring, the bold and not daring. So courage without thinking gets you killed. That makes sense. Whereas courage combined with an intelligent approach will help you survive a difficult situation so you can come back stronger. That also makes a lot of sense. Putting these together gives us a more complete picture of courage in the Tao. That number one, it must come from compassion in order to be a true manifestation of courage. And without compassion, that courage is a brutish, senseless kind of courage. And that corresponds with the beginning part of what we're studying today. Courage without thinking gets you killed because you are just being an idiotic, brutal attacker. And then on the other hand, courage combined with intelligence, combined with thoughtfulness, combined with a good plan, that's very powerful that will get you where you need to go, accomplish what you need to accomplish. So one of the more powerful lessons in life from Lao Tzu. Now let's get into line three, which brings up a point that I think, um, that I think is oftentimes not considered. Line three says, of these two, one may benefit, the other may harm. So the sense, I think, now that you understand line one and line two, I think the sense is pretty clear. It is saying that the benefit will be line two to be bold but not daring, biding your time, waiting for the right moment, you're gonna survive. You're gonna fight, you're gonna live to fight another day. That's a benefit. The other may harm, well that's line one, to be bold, to be recklessly daring, charging forward, only to meet with death. That is a harm. So, so here's the thing. Both these different paths originate from courage. They lead to different results. And indeed, when we look back on history, we see this is true. 
we can see that throughout history, the brave but foolish die by the millions. That's what happened historically. It's a historical fact. Whereas the brave who proceed intelligently are rewarded. We see that in history as well. So this is clear in every aspect of life. Initiative plus plenty will be consistently rewarded. Now, this has always been true since the beginning of humanity. And in fact, because these are the two opposite complementary approaches, I'm going to put a yin and yang symbol here as a reminder. There is on the one hand survival, on the other hand, extinction. This is the driving force of evolution. The reckless generation after generation are weeded out. Whereas the intelligence, the thoughtful, will survive and thrive. The yin and yang symbol can serve as a reminder of that. Now we can even see it in another way that'll make this distinction even more easy to grasp, even easier to grasp. I have a table here. They pertain to the two lines. The bold in daring will be killed. The bold in not daring will survive. So I've got at the very top, this boldness, that's the originating point. And then it goes off in two different, two different paths. One path on the left is the path of being rash, being reckless, daring in the sense of being negatively reckless. Then on the right hand side, the right hand column, not daring in the sense of being patient, waiting for the right moment, biding your time. This can apply to the ancient battlefield. It can apply to modern life. It can also apply to internal cultivation. So let's run through them. For the ancient battlefield, I think it's easy, easy to see a situation where soldiers are just blindly charging forward only to run into a deadly trap because they're charging forward without realizing what the dangers are right ahead of them. So that will be a disaster. Now, on the opposite side of that, in the ancient battlefield, if you could pause and observe enemy deployment and then attack the weakest link, you've got a far greater chance for success. You're still brave. You are fighting the enemy, but you are also fighting in an intelligent way and therefore you will be rewarded with victory. So that's a positive outcome. We previously talked about how the Tao can always apply to three different levels, ancient times, modern times, and internal aspects. Ancient times could be advice with the king. Here it's the clash of kingdoms. And then in modern life, it could be the individual, that's your life and my life. So let's talk about that. To be bold, which in our lives, in our modern lives, it just means that you are proactive, you take the initiative to get something done. But what if you are reckless? Reckless in this context means that you're proceeding forward without a plan, without a plan that you thought through. So being proactive and taking action but proceeding without a plan. Your chance for success is drastically diminished. What about on the right-hand side? To be bold, to, to be proactive, to take initiative, to take action, but not recklessly. It just means the opposite. To be proactive in taking action with a thought-through plan, not just any plan, but a plan where you've considered all the different aspects. What am I going to do? What am I trying to accomplish? What obstacles may I possibly encounter? How would I get around them if I come across those obstacles? It's a thought through plan that takes you from the beginning to the end. A good plan will have contingencies already 
thought of so that when you have an issue at any point, you can switch seamlessly to a different track. So these are all going to be rewarded by the DAO. Internal cultivation, how will we apply that in the internal context? Well, this is where we can see maybe a, a hint of ourselves or the people we know. That is, a person is motivated to better himself or herself, but not having really any guidance is doing so in a random fashion. That is, pick any fad that people are talking about and then try it. And then if it doesn't work out, then you jump from one fad to the next. Fads, by definition, don't last. Sometimes they become very popular, but it's short-lived. And then when it doesn't work out for you, you're going to have to come up with a different plan. So this is relatively common. Then the other side of it is hopefully your approach and mine that we all share the same thoughtful approach, that we want to carefully choose a path based on personal goals, then start walking that path. When you look at this table, you begin to see how common the situation can be for people without the Tao, for people who have not studied the Tao. So for instance, it's very common to feel all pumped up, full of excitement, but having no plan and having no clear ideas about the next steps to take. So that is not what we want for ourselves. Very common. And then um, let's, uh, so this is, uh, in summary, this is what the first two lines are about. This is an expansion of the first two lines. The left-hand side, the bold and daring will be killed. Map, mapping to present time, to your life and mine, it's, it's not you being killed, not you encountering death, but it may be the death of a plan, the death of a project, the death of a particular task that you want to accomplish. And then the other, the other part, the bold and not daring will survive, that's on the right-hand side. In modern times, it just means that you're going to succeed in what you're trying to accomplish. So moving on to line four. Line four says, the one hated by heaven, who knows the reason? Okay, what is that? Well, what is the one hated by heaven? It's the one that has a lot of death associated with it. That is the reckless part. It seems you can see it sort of like the reckless are consistently being punished by heaven for being reckless. So who knows the reason? Well, let's dig into that a little bit. First of all, we see the good and bad results are highly consistent throughout history. When you go about it the right way with intelligence, good results are probable, likely. When you go about it recklessly, bad results, very common, very often seen. So it feels as if the deities in heaven hate and punish the reckless. The ancients, ancient people could definitely see it that way. They could see that they could understand and relate to the statements that the deities hate this particular kind of person and therefore the deities will mete out punishment for them. Now, we human beings, we ourselves, have evolved to prefer intelligence. We prefer the smart way to do things. We don't like the, the idiotic way, the, the, uh, the way that is not optimal, let's say. We know foolish people end up hurting themselves and possibly also other people who may not be foolish but happen to be around. So the foolish can cause a lot of damage, not just to themselves, but to other people as well. This is why we human beings prefer the intelligence, 
versus the foolish. So the question becomes, does heaven feel the same way? Like, how does heaven see this? Is heaven like us with feelings about how people are and how, which people are good, which people are bad? How can that work? I did not realize that heaven has feelings or the Tao has feelings. This is the central dilemma that Lao Tzu is talking about because the sages know the Tao does not have human emotions. This is a central idea from the beginning of Tao philosophy thousands and thousands of years ago. Thousands of years before the time of Lao Tzu, this was a foundational principle. So why does the Tao seem to inflict horrible punishment on the idiotic? That's line one. The boat in reckless daring. They'll be killed. Why does the Tao seem to reward the careful and patient with success? You know, they're not they're they're not cowardly they're still bold they're getting things done they're achieving success but they're careful and patient and why is it that they seem favored by the Tao? so why does the Tao seem to prefer one over the other prefer the thoughtful over the thoughtless and then Lao Tzu says even the sages have a tough time explaining the above Now, let me say that when we see reckless leading to death, careful leading to survival and success, we can think of it as karma. We can call it karma, but at the time that Lao Tzu lived, karma was not a term known to the sages, including Lao Tzu, because the term karma comes from the Buddhist tradition from India. At the time that Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching, Buddhism was just coming into existence in India, had not yet spread to ancient China. So they knew about the idea behind karma, the circular nature of life and personal interactions. This chapter is the proof of that. The sages knew about the circular patterns. They knew that it applied to human affairs. Goodness and badness go around and come around. They realize that, but they use different terms to express the concept. So let's talk about the origin of this whole idea of the Tao being without emotions, without feelings. So as I said, this concept has a long history that goes back thousands of years before Lao Tzu. It never changed in the 2,500 years since the time of Lao Tzu. One example is from the Qingjing Jing. This is a classic that was written about 1,200 years ago in the Tang Dynasty. Uh, the book that you see in this slide is the Tao of Tranquility. That is the translation that I wrote to explain this classic. And here's what Qingjing Jing says in the very beginning. Lao Jun says, the great Tao has no form. It gives birth to heaven and earth. The great Tao has no emotions. It moves the sun and moon. The great Tao has no name. It constantly nurtures all living things. I do not know its name. I am forced to call it the Tao. So this part in the middle, which is basically starting on line four of the Qingjing Jing is talking about the Tao having no emotions. So why would the ancients say that about the Tao? Why does the great Tao not have emotions? It flows naturally from the understanding that the Tao is not a god, not a deity. The various deities in every culture every religion around the world, every mythology, they are more often than not emotionally motivated, just like us. 
The Tao, on the other hand, acts without emotional motivation. We see rain, that when the rain falls, it is falling on beautiful flowers and weeds alike. No distinction. The Tao doesn't favor beautiful flowers and water that more so than the weeds. We see it in the sunlight that shines on good and bad people alike. Good and bad people receive the warmth from the sunlight equally. Sun doesn't favor one from the other. The Tao does not favor one country over another in a war. It does not side with one team over another in a sports contest. Like basketball game, football game, it would not be accurate to say that the Tao is with one particular team but not the other. The Tao is with the team that excels more so than the other team. So the, the Tao does not resemble anything that we associate with the deity. Uh, it doesn't need fellowship with us. It needs nothing beyond itself. It demands no worship from us. It demands nothing from anyone. It experiences no joy when we follow it, no sadness when we turn away from it. We're the only ones that feel good or bad based on what we create for ourselves. So regardless of our feelings, not the feelings of the Tao, our feelings have no effect on the Tao, and the Tao offers no praise or condemnation, no approval or disapproval. That is why the Tao has no emotions. Now, this is uh, there's more to the Qing Jing Jing than what we can talk about here. Uh, this material is from chapter one from this book, The Tao of Tranquility. So in case you're curious about that, it is available uh, pretty much everywhere. So let's jump to the summary to conclude our talk today. But let me say that even though Lao Tzu presents it as a puzzle, like who knows why heaven appears to favor one over the other, uh, doesn't heaven, uh, uh, isn't it true that the Tao has no emotions? Well, even though Lao Tzu presents it as a puzzle, it is actually easily understood. You and I know that the reckless who get themselves killed, it is not because of some entity disliking them and wish to punish them. You and I know very well that the reckless have done it to themselves, that they have failed to follow the Tao and therefore they are reaping a negative result. Likewise, someone who is succeeding in life due to being proactive and yet putting plans into action, well, it isn't because they're favored by the Tao or the heavenly deities, it is because they are walking the path correctly, they've done it themselves. So we ourselves are the causes for our fortune and misfortune. Indirectly, that is what Lao Tzu is trying to convey to us. Let's summarize what we are, what we have talked about today. The bold in daring, the bold in not daring. So first of all, we want to know exactly what we're getting into. In life, we want to move forward, but not blindly or in the dark. You want to know what's ahead of you. You want to pause as you proceed. Occasionally, you want to pause, assess the situation before continuing. You want to follow a cadence, work, pause, progress, pause, assess the situation before taking the next step. And then number two, choose the right time and place to act. This is all about having a plan. Plan things out whenever possible. Be the person with the plan. I used to say, be the man with the plan or the woman with the plan. Now I will generalize and say, be the person with the plan. What happens is that you will notice when you consistently have a plan for anything, everything, you will find that most people don't. Most people don't have a plan. They haven't thought about it. 
and they will naturally gather around the one who does. This is another way that you win people over with your virtue of preparation. So when you are ready, when all of your resources are lined up, you will find that the perfect moment will come. That is when, intuitively, you know when to act, and that produces the best possible results. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us all travel safely so we can meet again. Until next time, may the Dell fill you with peace and happiness.